Okay. Good morning. This is Dr. Carol McMakin with Frequency Specific Seminars. Um, we are having some technical difficulties on our end of this. So we aren't able to broadcast the slides, but you should be able to find them at um, the Frequency Specific website, or we're going to send them to you. But I'm going to be speaking as if I'm going from the slides. <clears throat> we also can't hear you, so um, but we can see your typed in responses. So um, first effort, I think this is going pretty well so far. Um, frequency specific microcurrent has turned out to be a new tool for some very old and difficult problems medicine. So the frequencies, everybody wants to know where the frequencies came from. The frequencies were developed in the early 1900s somehow by mostly medical physicians and osteopaths in the United States and England, and they're used by thousands of physicians between about 1908, as near as we can tell, until um, about 1934. 1910, the Flexner Report came out. Medicine surgery was the way that medicine was going to go and that anybody who used electromagnetic therapies, uh, homeopathic remedies, nutrition, um, or herbs would lose their license to practice, which at that time was granted by the American Medical Association. So by 1934 or so, the machines were all moved to the back room, covered up with sheets, and when that generation of physicians died, information about how the frequencies were developed, what all the early research was, um, all of that disappeared. <coughs> so we got frequencies in 1995 from an osteopath by the name of Harry Van Gelder. Harry Van Gelder bought a practice in Vancouver, BC in 1946, walked into the purchased, went into the back room, and there's one of these machines in the back with a sheet over it. He uncovered the machine, and um, there was a list of frequencies underneath the machine. He taught himself to use the frequencies and became really widely known in Canada and the western part of the U.S. So in 1995, list of frequencies that came with this machine that was built in 1922 <clears throat> that Harry found in the practice in 1946. George Douglas got this list of frequencies about 1983 or so when he worked with Harry, and I received the list in 1995. Started using it mostly for myofascial pain in patients, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, and um, had such amazing results. About 1997, we, I decided we had to teach it to find out if it was reproducible. It's like, were these results real or was, were they working because the walls in the clinic were pink and I was a nice guy? Um, all of the information that we all want to know about where the frequencies came from, how they were developed, who developed them, how did they figure it out, um, all of that is gone because that genes is gone. So I have no idea how frequencies were derived. <clears throat> Mechanism of action is unknown, but we have some pretty good guesses at this point. And the equipment from the 1920s was not microcurrent. It was DC direct current from plug-in-the-wall devices. So that's where the frequencies came from. Um, started using them in 1995 and used them in all sorts of um, conditions, everything from new injuries to um, to nerve pain. There are some old problems in medicine, um, healing injury, treating patients after surgery, healing wounds. Um, there are some limitations to repair that are sort of unavoidable. Um, energy production, for one, ATP production. How much blood supply can you get to a tissue that's been injured? how quickly and how effectively can you 
produce collagen and elastin. Collagen is connected tissue. Elastin is what makes connected tissue stretchy and, and healthy, usable, <clears throat> functional. So you have to ask yourself, what would happen to healing if you could increase cellular energy production by 500%? Well, that's where the microcurrent comes in. We use frequencies to change the tissue, but the current that delivers the frequencies is microamperage current. It's current in million seven amp. And the basic science on just the current was done by Nock Chang in 1982 and then repeated by Seegers in 2001 and 2002. And all, of, all three of those papers show that current between 10 and 500 microamps increased ATP production or energy production by 500%, by five times. That increased protein synthesis by 70%, and that increased amino acid transport by 40%. And Seegers added to this measuring cyclic AMP in human lymphocytes. So this was done in vivo, in living cells. Um, and so we have some mechanism for proving or demonstrating that the ATP production has been increased. <clears throat> we know that the microcurrent from Seeger's week, we know that the current by itself, this is unmodulated, just the current, activates signal transduction, increases energy production. Microcurrent is approved by the FDA and uh, the category of TENS devices, um, transcutaneous electrical neurostimulation. Um, it's approved in the category of TENS, even though it's got a thousand times less current than TENS. So it's proved in the category of TENS because it has a battery, um, even though it's definitely not a TENS. It's a completely different mechanism of action. It's millions of an amp. It's the same kind of current that your body produces on its own. There is microcurrent that is approved for aesthetics use with no pain claims made. <coughs> And this is non-prescription, so you can get these little gadgets at, um, I don't know, Walmart or on the internet or in multi-level marketing um, projects, or if they're used by your esthetician when she does your facial treatments. Um, if you're a medical provider or a patient, the microcurrent is going to build, be billed as if it's a TENS. Microcurrent devices available on the market and used by physicians very widely. They use direct current or pulsed DC direct current. There are sine waves, there are square waves, there are ramp square waves, there's a tsunami wave. <clears throat> there are one channel devices, two channel devices. Um, there are combined units that just run three tens of hertz microcurrent, but they combine microcurrent with ultrasound, interferential, galvanic. Um, and in general, in all of these devices, the, the frequency is not important. They did some basic science with rabbits <clears throat> Sorry about the frogs. Um, they did some basic science with rabbits in 20 days of microcurrent. So they ran these rabbits, I think, an hour a day for just three tenths of a hertz, put them in their cages with microcurrent back feet to front feet so their tissue was um, exposed to the current. And the current by itself increased vascularity. So they biopsied the bunnies on day one and they biopsied the day bunnies on. Um, at the end of 20 days of microcurrent. Um, vascularity increased by 39%, collagen increased by 14%, and amazing for our purposes is that elastin increased by 48%. Elastin is what makes repair tissue and healthy connective tissue stretchy and functional. So you have to ask yourself what would happen to injury and wound healing outcomes if you could increase ATP production, vascularity, collagen, and elastin. Well, we found that out with <clears throat> the following research. Denise Curtis um, did a study at the National Training Center in Ireland on delayed onset muscle soreness. And in Allen's research in 1999, they used single channel microcurrent, um, three tenths of hertz and 30 hertz for 20 minutes directly after exercise and found that it had absolutely no effect on delayed onset muscle soreness whatsoever. And um, then we, Denise did her study using the frequencies to stop bleeding, to repair the breakage, to reduce inflammation. And in her study, <coughs> 
um, the, it was a control trial, so the treated leg at 24 hours, pain level was a 1.3. The sham leg they had a placebo treatment applied to it. The pain level was 5 out of 10 on a 0 to 10 scale. At 48 hours, it's always the worst, and the sham leg was a 7 out of 10 pain, and the treated leg was 1.2 out of 10. The p-value, for those of you that know anything about statistics, was... 0 0.0005, which is huge, um, showing that we can treat new injuries using frequencies uh, helps, um, doesn't prevent delayed onset muscle soreness, it helps, but the frequencies make a huge difference, and this would be why there are mm, probably six, eight NFL teams, two or three National Hockey League teams, the professional athletes are using frequency specific microcurrent in the training room and there are over 200 um, athletes who own their own custom care units. So we have one physician, John Cale, who did a post-op study. The use of FSM directly after surgery, and in this case, um, shortened the hospital stay by um, about a third of a day, so from 2.9 days to 3.3 days. Um, reduced post-op pain at rest, and most importantly, reduced post-op pain with activity so the patients could be up and more active more easily. <clears throat> FSM outcomes in wound healing are just extraordinary. Um, we haven't found anybody yet that it doesn't work on. So the pictures you're going to see on the slides when you can get to the slides are um, it's a diabetic patient with necrosis in his second toe with a huge... Uh, seven centimeter long um, ulcer on the medial side of his left leg and that um, healed in 14 days. The necrosis on his left toe resolved in seven treatment on his, sorry, the necrosis on his third digit resolved in seven, seven treatments. The necrosis, the black, that toe would have been amputated resolved in 12 treatments. So if you know anybody that has diabetic wounds, um, so far, FSM has been, um, but it doesn't work on. Usually, the wound is healed within two to four weeks with two to three treatments a week. Um, it's easier, of course, with good blood sugar control. <clears throat> Other problems in medicine, old problems in medicine, inflammation is associated with all of the degenerative diseases and immune system activation. And the problem is that anti-inflammatory drugs take too long, have too many side effects, and the inflammatory peptides like cytokines are really hard to change. Functional medicine is the modern approach for these old problems in medicine, and it's an extraordinary system. Um, it works really well, but in terms of patient compliance, it tends to take too long and it costs too much. So you have to ask what would happen to this problem in medicine or in your healthcare um, approach if you could reduce lipoxygenase-mediated inflammation by 62% in four minutes and reduce COX-mediated inflammation by 30% in four minutes. That's equivalent to injectable Toradol, which is what they give patients after surgeries. <coughs> We had blinded animal research, not that the animals were blind, but the researchers were blinded to what was being used. They paint arachidonic acid on the mouse's ears and then they measure the swelling in the mouse's ears with these little calipers and um, that gives you an objective measurement of inflammation and it's directly related and it's a well worked out model for studying inflammation when you measure the swelling with these little mechanical calipers. So they found a 62% reduction in lipoxygenase-mediated inflammation and a 30% reduction in COX-mediated inflammation. So LOX is associated with basically all of the degenerative diseases, irritable bowel, Crohn's, asthma, um, inflammatory bowel diseases, neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and early onset, um, cognitive decline, <coughs> COX-mediated, Inflammation is um, associated with uh, acute injuries, as you're all aware. And the frequency 40 hertz on channel A and 116 hertz on channel B um, reduced COX-mediated inflammation equivalent to injectable toradol when it was 
studied by the same researcher in the same animal model. And that is as compared to a placebo. So that frequency combination um, was effective. And they, um, they tested three other frequency combinations and no other frequency had any effect on, um, on reducing inflammation. So we know that the frequency response was very specific, it was frequency specific. Um, the frequencies for new injuries, frequencies for removing calcium from bone, none of those frequencies had any effect on reducing inflammation. So then they studied um, sunburn. So arachidonic acid and uh, myrcyl stearate cause one kind of swelling. Sunburn causes another kind of swelling. So they um, sunburn the mice. These are little hairless white mice with, with no hair on their ears. And um, the group that had no treatment had a predictable amount of swelling at 21, 23, 25, and 27 hours. Microcurrent that was administered uh, immediately after <clears throat> immediately after the um, sun, sunburn exposure didn't have a significant effect on reducing inflammation. Microcurrent that was applied, and this is 40 hertz on A and 116 hertz in channel B, um, was applied at uh, two hours after the treatment had a statistically significant um, ability to reduce swelling. What we found is you really can treat sunburn with FSM. Uh, we add the frequencies to reduce uh, radiation exposure as well as the frequencies to reduce inflammation. So frequencies reduce the swelling um, when they were applied at two hours. There's a additional piece of this experiment that was done where they paint um, oxazolone on the mouse's hind leg at the time of the sunburn exposure. And it's a contact sensitizing agent, so you should develop an allergic response to it. That's a normal response is 30 units of ear swelling when the oxazolone is painted on the ear two weeks after the first application. So you paint oxazolone on the hind leg, you sunburn the mice, that suppresses the immune response, and then two weeks later you paint the oxazolone on the ear and it should swell in a mouse that has not been sunburned. So the group that was not sunburned had 30 units of swelling when the oxazolone was painted on their ears two weeks later. The group that were sunburned had the swelling decreased by 63%. So that's an immune suppression response created by the sunburn. The short version, this is a complicated slide and if you can't see it, it's kind of tricky. But the short version is that the group that was treated immediately with microcurrent had their immune suppression reduced in half from 63 to 31% two weeks after 40 hertz on A and 116 hertz on B were, um, were uh, applied. So this frequency application created a permanent change in immune system um, function that was remarkable. So the mouse research is important to know <coughs> that the 40 hertz on A and 116 hertz on B, that frequency specific response, um, lox and cox are associated with asthma, COPD, irritable bowel, Crohn's, pancreatitis, ulcerative colitis, liver disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and degenerative arthritis of all sorts. So the ability to reduce inflammation without side effects by using a frequency is an extraordinary um, tool in improving healthcare and patient response to um, in, these, in these inflammatory conditions. So there's an additional uh, measure of inflammation, marker for inflammation called cytokines. They're peptides that are associated with um, inflammation. Chemistry of it is more complicated than um, I'm able to talk about or you're probably interested in. The clinical response is the important part as far as I'm concerned. 
So we had a group of fibromyalgia patients whose fibromyalgia was associated with spine trauma and <clears throat> whose fibromyalgia was associated with spine trauma. And it's a very particular presentation. Um, it's a very particular presentation. Um, their hands hurt, their feet hurt, their pain level is higher than average. Um, I would say it's an average of a 7.4 on a 0 to 10 scale. Um, the reflexes are not normal. Um, as a group, they're the only people that um, complain of fibro only fibromyalgia patients who complain of specifically of pain in their hands and feet. So in 1999, we treated the first patient. By the end of 99, we had 25 patients. By the end of 2000, we had 54 um, patients. Um, if the patients had a history of trauma associated with the onset of their fibromyalgia, um, there, this one frequency combination was the only frequency that was effective and we didn't find anybody that it didn't work on. Um, we published a paper in 2005, 54 consecutive fibromyalgia patients. They were nine, an average of nine years chronic, so any place between one and 50 years. And I took 25 of these cases to the National Institutes of Health and um, presented this case report and asked the assembled research there that could help us measure something objective that was changing. And um, Terry Phillips came up at the end of the lecture and said, I can tell you what's changing. So I sent him a blood sample on a patient, uh, samples on 13 patients um, with fibromyalgia. Uh, there were um, six patients who made the met the criteria for being included in the study. So it was a 7.4. The average exiting pain was 1.3. Takes 60 to 90 minutes for the pain to go from uh, 7 to a 0. Um, it, pain recedes from the feet up. These patients recover from fibromyalgia um, using FSM in the office. Most of them had FSM as home units who were sent for physical therapy. We had to do reconditionings. Most of them took supplements. You still had to treat the gut, the adrenals, maybe interstitial cystitis. Um, so I sent the these, these sample to Terry Phillips, and what he sent back was this, the data on the next slide, which you can't see, obviously. Um, he sent, uh, sent back um, data on cytokines. Um, and I didn't know anything about cytokines. I picked up the facts data as I was heading out the door to give this presentation at um, the Institute for Functional Medicine um, Symposium in 2000. And I arrived with these numbers and asked Dr. Bland, um, Jeff Bland, there's this cytokine data and it looks good, but I don't know if that's if it's easy to achieve. If if it's what everybody sees, how how impressive is this? He said, "Well, call Michael Ruff. He's in Candace Pert's office, and um, they've done all the basic. You know, they've done a lot of work with cytokines. So um, give Michael a call." So I called Dr. Ruff and introduced myself and said, "Well, I've got this cytokine data, and I don't know whether it's significant." And he said, "Okay, what are the numbers?" And I said, "Well, interleukin one goes from." 392.8, so 393 down to 21. And it was like the line went dead. And I said, Doc, Dr. Ruff, are you there? And he said, what time frame? I said, oh, it's about 90 minutes. He said, that's not possible. Cytokines are, are really hard to change, and, and when they do change, they change really slowly. And I was um, ignorant enough and enthusiastic enough that I said, well, no, they're not hard to change. They all change like that. He said, well, well, interleukin-1 went from 393 down to 21. TNF-alpha went from 299 down to 20. Interleukin-6 went from 204 down to 15. So these are changes in inf inflammation that are impossible to see medically. And they happen in 90 minutes, and they happened in... Um, we published the six that met the inclusionary criteria for the paper, but we got data like this on 13 patients. I said, that's impossible. 
Um, so that's when I found out that we actually had some impressive and significant data. And then David Perlmutter uh, at the faculty meeting at the dinner that night asked, well, what does substance P do? He said, if you're changing substance P, then you know that you're ch it's produced in the spinal cord, you know that you're changing the spinal cord because the frequencies that we use are for inflammation in the spinal cord, reducing inflammation in the spinal cord. Substance P went down by a factor of more than 10 times from 132 down to um, 10 in 90 minutes. Endorphins go up. Um, the patients effectively at about 20, the blink rate slows down. They, they slow down the breathing rate, their heart rate and their blink rate all slow down at about 10 to 15 minutes. At 20 minutes, they start getting pretty sleepy. At 30 minutes, they're pretty stoned. There's kind of no other way to describe it. It's like giving them about half a cc of Versed. Um, this index patient, the very first patient, by the time her endorphins reached probably 20 to 40 at the 35 minute mark, she looked up at me and she said, is this legal? And I said, yeah, it's legal. So endorphins go up uh, from five to 88 in this index patient. Cortisol goes up, but it's not a stress response because cortisol follows endorphins. Neuropeptide Y follows the stress response, so it follows the sympathetic nervous system and it uh, goes down. So this elevation in cortisol is not a stress response. The eleva elevation in cortisol is secondary to the increase in, in endorphins. When you raise endorphins, you create a, a peptide. One half of it is ACTH, the uh, adrenal stimulating hormone, and the other half is beta lipotropin. So cortisol goes up. Uh, from 15 to 169, but not because of stress, but because it's um, uh, secondary to the rise in endorphins. <clears throat> and then pain goes down from a 7.3 to a 1.3, and this was in, as an average in all of these patients. So we have 54 of them. Um, uh, the six that had their... Um, uh, cytokines, the blood samples measured, that p-value went from 7 point, pain went from 7.3 out of 10 to 1.3 out of 10 as an average in all the patients, all 54 of them, and that p-value has um, effectively six zeros. So there is less than one chance in over a million that this was um, coincidence. It is indeed the treatment that did cause the reduction in pain. So this the data is wonderful, but what it means to me is that there are uh, the 28% of fibromyalgia patients in the world, or in the US, there's 6 million fibromyalgia patients in the United States, 28% of them have fibromyalgia associated with spine trauma, and this data and this treatment has a way to get these patients out of pain. Recovery is another conversation, that's more complicated, but getting them out of pain is we haven't found anybody doesn't work on. 58% of the patients re experience resolution of fibromyalgia within four months, but all of the patients experience pain relief. Getting a patient to recover from fibromyalgia is uh, another, another conversation. So even 18 years chronic, this one patient, uh, December 8th, she had 14 of 18 tender points, tender to less than four pounds per square inch pressure. January 12th, she had 11 of 18 tender points. February 8th, she had 7 of 18 tender points. She was off of virtually all of her medication, and she kept that recovery for six years. So those are the, that's some of the data that we have in um, inflammation. But patients are concerned about pain, practitioners and um, physicians and physical therapists and occupational therapists and acupuncturists and treating physicians of all sort are um, concerned with getting their patients out of pain. And there are different kinds of pain, nerve pain, muscle pain, and scar tissue. The problem with the traditional treatments for nerve pain, muscle pain, and scar tissue is that they take too long. They hurt. Um, it costs too much, and the treatments are in general not very effective. Dry needling is for trigger points, and, and muscle pain is um, uh, quite painful and um, has a number of risks. 
um, epidurals for nerve pain are very expensive and carry a fair amount of risk. And when you can use frequency specific microcurrent to treat nerve pain, muscle pain, and scar tissue, what you find is that the treatment is incredibly effective, no side effects, and very little risk. So we published a paper in um, the pain practitioner in 2010. I had 20 patients, I've actually treated hundreds, but these are 20 that I could find in the charts and collect the um, case report data. Average chronicity for nerve pain was 6.7 um, years, so close to seven years. All patients experienced pain reduction. Uh, the pain was reduced in the first treatment from an average of a 6.8 out of 10 to a 1.8, so roughly from a seven to a two at the first treatment. They came back in at a 5, 4.8 out of 10, uh, in the second treatment. So there was some improvement that was residual, and they left with their pain at a 1. So to go from a 7 out of 10 to a 1 out of 10 in two treatments is in nerve pain. This is strictly radiculopathies like sciatic or nerve pain from disc injuries in the neck. Um, it's quite extraordinary. 65% um, of these neuropathic pain patients recovered fully in um, an average of five treatments. There are no adverse reactions except for this um, phenomenon of getting kind of stoned. So they get a little bit, more than a little bit loopy, relaxed, um, fuzzy headed. That's temporary. That's gone within an hour. And, um, and the nerve pain went away. 25% of the patients terminated care prior to recovery, and they, some of that we think might have something to do with when you've been in pain for an average of seven years. Um, it's kind of hard to get to know who you are without your nerve pain. Trigger points in the neck, published 50 cases in 1998, five years average chronicity, range was one to 28 years, and you always want a control group. Well, in this case, the patients served as their own control because 88% of them had failed with other treatments. They were all referred in from medical physicians, physical therapists, chiropractors, acupuncturists. Um, we figured if they were going to have a placebo response, they would have had it with one of the other six people that had treated them prior to um, treatment with frequency specific. So in cervical myofascial pain, um, it took 11 visits in eight weeks to get the pain down from an average of a 7 to an average of 1.5. And it took 11 treatments in eight weeks because I honestly didn't know what I was doing. Back in 1998, I didn't realize that most of cervical um, trigger points, myofascial trigger points, we feel these tight muscles. But the muscles are tight because of disc injuries, facet injuries, and ligamentous laxity in the cervical spine. And back then, we didn't know that. These days, it's much easier to get cervical myofascial patients um, to recovery. It takes much less than 11 visits in eight weeks. But even back when we didn't know much, it was, uh, it was pretty impressive. Um, so lumbar myofascial pain was the next published paper. That was in 2004. This was eight years average chronicity, so even worse. 87% had failed with other treatments. So basically, the patient served as their own controls. Lumbar myofascial pain, we just got lucky. It really was the muscles. And it took uh, six visits in six weeks to get the pain from an average of a 7 to an average of a 1.5. So 6.8 down to a 1.5 out of 10. Um, when the pain is caused by uh, adhesions and scar tissue, um, thanks to Dr. Bart Flick and um, Dr. Roger Huckfeld at Mercy St. John's Burn Unit in Springfield, Missouri, um, we did a study where we treated um, scar tissue in uh, mature burns. So these are patients who have been burned and the scar tissue from burns is very dense, very non-elastic, and it's very difficult to treat. Um, we treated eight patients uh, an hour a day for three days, and every patient has statistically significant permanent increases in range of motion after three one-hour treatments. The OTs and PTs measured them on Monday and Friday. I treated them Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Had statistically significant increases in range of motion. That's not really the impressive part, though. The impressive part for me was that what it meant was that a 12-year-old girl who had a burn on her face could now smile because the labial fold was no longer scarred shut. 
um, it meant that uh, a patient could hold a coffee cup. It meant that a patient could get out of the wheelchair because his ankles would go to 110 degrees instead of 75, and they could get him in braces and get him up walking for the first time in three years. So dissolving scar tissue is one of the things we're really good at. We did a research project at Baylor Medical School uh, with David Wiseman, he's a PhD there, who has developed a um, surgical uh, process for inducing abdominal adhesions. So he does um, a surgery on a rat, uh, like a, a week ago, a week before the, our project happened, and you abrade the rat's um, intestines, and then you put a stitch between the intestine and the abdominal wall, and then you close the rat back up, rat recovers, and one week later you have an adhesion between the cecum and the abdominal wall um, that you would have to cut with scissors because a scalpel won't go through it. Um, it is dense, it's cartilaginous, the only place I've seen scar tissue, anything like this, is in uh, surgeries that I've observed with patients of mine who had endometriosis or um, uh, a combination of endometriosis and um, uh, one of the inflammatory bowel diseases. So we got permission, Dr. Wiseman got permission to open up three of these rats the following week so that we could try frequencies with the rat open um, and see what those frequencies did to the scar tissue, if anything, because we knew we could treat abdominal adhesions with uh, frequency-specific microcurrent, and this meant that we could change pelvic pain, and that's Dr. Wiseman's specialty. So we opened up the rats, and he snipped the stitch so that the only thing holding this thing together was scar tissue that looked like cartilage. It was, it's dense, it's thick, it's indescribable, it's tough. So I put microcurrent contacts on the either side of the rat's abdomen, and there are about six frequency combinations that I wanted to use or to try to see if they would influence the scar tissue. Um, so Dr. Wiseman had the cecum in some forceps and applied just a little bit of, you know, just enough so we could watch the adhesion. And I tried three different frequencies and absolutely nothing changed. 58, 00, 02, 32. Scarring in the fascia, right? Because the abdominal wall is fascia. So 13 on A and 142 hertz on B. Scarring in the fascia. Scarring in the blood supply. So it could have been the blood supply, right? So scarring in the blood supply. And nothing happened. The next frequency I tried was the frequency for scarring in the connective tissue. I didn't expect it to work. And what happened was that this adhesion went from white and hard and cartilaginous to snot. It liquefied. It became clear and just liquefied. So associated with scar tissue and adhesions, especially inside the abdomen, we now have maybe five years worth of um, clinical data that says that we can change this kind of pain. So when you're doing frequency-specific microcurrent, if you're a manual therapist or if you're a patient who's seeing a manual therapist, the two things, FSM and manual therapy, go well together. So if you can dissolve the scar tissue and then move the body in a functional way, it really adds to the effectiveness. There's one. There's one frequency combination. The only thing it's um, good for is shingles, oral and genital herpes and shingles. Um, gen the paper that was published was on um, uh, shingles in the ophthalmic branch of five in an 85-year-old man. Uh, it took four hours of treatment. He was pain-free in one hour, but because of the location and because of his age, he was treated for four hours, pain-free in one hour, no return of pain, and then the lesions were gone in 48 hours. Um, when we did, it's a, so it's a very frequency specific response. When we did the animal research, um, no other frequency reduced inflammation except for 40 hertz on A and 116 hertz on B. So you got to be wondering, right, how is it that frequencies can affect 
um, your body this way. Um, the human body is a quantum biological system. There are lots of books out there on it now. Um, living tissue is biochemicals, and um, biochemicals are made up of molecules and atoms that are all held together by electromagnetic bonds. And in point of fact, every bond of any sort has a frequency at which it resonates. So a frequency where a, um, the bond itself vibrates and responds to a particular frequency. Your body looks solid, but it in truth is an electromagnetic system where the cells function um, as a semiconductor network. Um, water molecules lie in every cell and tissue in your body and turn it turn your body into something very much like a computer chip. Um, you're a semiconductor. So as a semiconductor, you convey current, charge, and information. Your cells and your genes are regulated by cell membrane receptors, and those cell mem membrane receptors are sensitive to signaling. So let's say you have an infection. You'll get little bits of um, DNA from or cell membrane uh, particles from bacteria that land on your white blood cells. They land on a receptor in a white blood cell. That activates um, gene transcription factors inside the cell that change the genes in the cell and make that cell produce pro-inflammatory cytokines that, that create a biological answer in uh, to this um, cell membrane receptor signal. Drugs and nutrients act like keys in a lock, right? So when a drug or a, even a supplement or a, a vitamin or a, a, any sort of chemical lands on a receptor it ch on any of your cells, it changes the configuration of the receptor kind of the way your key goes into your door lock and mechanically changes the lock from closed to open or open to closed. Frequencies work the same way, but the way your key fob opens that same lock with an electromagnetic signal. So the key fob on your car key opens your door specifically. It's tuned. It's frequency specific. It opens your door, not the car next to it. It opens your front door first, and then it opens your back door. And it does that with an electromagnetic signal from 20 or 40 feet away. So the frequencies act as if they dissolve the scar tissue cross links. It acts as if it disassembles the shingles virus capsid. And it acts as if it changes cell signaling um, to reduce inflammation by changing that cell membrane receptor with a signal from the key fob that is the frequency-specific microcurrent. So you can learn more about frequency-specific microcurrent by going to the website, frequencyspecific.com. Um, there is a textbook that you can get on Amazon called Frequency-Specific Microcurrent in Pain Management. It's published by Elsevier. It's available either off of the frequency-specific website or um, off of Amazon. Um, and it just gives the frequencies for pain management. There are frequencies for visceral conditions that are taught in the seminars um, and in the new book that's coming out um, next year. So there's a three-day seminar, FSM um, seminar, that's three and a half days, introduction on Thursday night, and then three eight-hour days. It's like learning a language in three days. Um, the there are six practicums, so it's a hands-on training. It is intense. It is um, a lot to learn in three days, but at the end of it, you are safe to treat patients uh, effectively for both pain complaints and visceral medicine complaints. And if you are a practitioner and you're listening, listening um, I have to warn you that frequency-specific microcurrent will change your life. Uh, your practice, your expectations of what is possible, and it will change your outcomes. And once you know what you know at the end of this seminar, you can't go back. It changes everything. Um, 
about what you thought was possible. Um, I strongly encourage you, if you're a practitioner, to come and take the course. We have it on DVD or in person. We do um, eight to 10 seminars a year. If you're a patient, if you can take this information to your provider, um, anybody that can use an electrical stim device as part of their practice can use frequency specific microcurrent. Um, MDs, chiropractors, acupuncturists, physical therapists, occupational therapists. Um, I don't think I left anybody out. Um, naturopaths, there you go. Osteopaths um, can all use FSM. So let your practitioners know that there's a way to treat your pain, that there's a way to treat your pancreatitis and your asthma that doesn't involve drugs. And um, see if we can't change medicine one patient at a time, one practitioner at a time. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Now what?